Hey, this is Vancouver Overcast with Mike Klassen. I'm Mike Klassen, and I'm really pleased to have you here on the line with us today. Uh, the federal election has just concluded. Uh, some very interesting results. A lot of people are saying that it was a nothing election. Uh, there were no changes. But the fact is, for uh, regional governments and for Metro Vancouver in particular, there are going to be some changes. We saw changes in the political landscape, but we also see a lot of money moving around for transportation, housing, and other projects. So the outcome of this election was very important to the people who live here. And I have two guests today that are going to provide us with, I think, some interesting perspectives perspective on the politics and the possibilities of what will happen as a result of this election. We have a, a great uh, uh, range of subjects that we're going to be talking about. So I'd like to introduce to you uh, my two guests. Uh, first, uh, Lisa Dominato. Uh, Lisa is a strategic leader with 20 years experience in government administration, public policy and communications and stakeholder relations. She's worked as a public relations consultant specializing in building social license for projects aimed at delivering uh, benefits to the public. She was elected to Vancouver School Board in 2017 during a by-election and then elected to Vancouver City Council in 2018 and uh, was elected as a member of the Nonpartisan Association and currently sits on council as an independent. Rob McDowell, uh, I'm pleased to have Rob here, is a former diplomat and a passionate uh, arts and culture supporter. Uh, Rob ran for election to, to Vancouver City Council in the 2014 and 2018 municipal elections and has been heavily involved in community improvement projects, both in Vancouver and abroad. Uh, he's volunteered on numerous nonprofit boards. Rob has worked abroad, uh, covering, uh, did work abroad covering Indochina for the Economist Group. He served in several diplomatic posts in Vietnam and in China until the year 2000. Uh, so uh, working back here, Rob has uh, worked as a project manager and during the uh, COVID uh, pandemic has decided to uh, launch a new sustainable travel agency business that he calls Pivot Travel. And uh, of course, Rob it has been a featured host on the Vancouver Viewpoints podcast. With all that, Lisa, Rob, very pleased to have you here. Um, welcome. Uh, do you, uh, um, what do you think about uh, what happened in, uh, uh, during the federal election? Were you watching it really closely uh, uh, or were you just too busy or uh, uninterested as many Canadians are? Maybe I'll start with you, Rob. Oh, great. And thanks. Uh, great to be here, Mike. Um, well, certainly I followed it with interest. I think it's always important to follow what's going on in terms of politics in this country and how it's going to impact Vancouver and what's what you know what the outcome is going to be. I think it was a real interesting election. I thought it was a nail biter kind of right to the end. And despite the results, um, I, I I think it was fascinating and it, it'll be an interesting one to to pick apart, look at the data. Lisa, sort of your quick impressions of the election. I know you're a political junkie like uh, all of us. You probably watched uh, the daily poll results and what have you, but what were your kind of overall impressions of this uh, interesting election campaign? Yeah, certainly I was following it, Mike, and uh, it was a little tricky because of the timing when it was called right in the middle of August, I have to admit, um, but, but I do think it's important to follow. Um, I didn't feel there was a really clear ballot box question for the public in terms of this federal election. Uh, and what I did observe was particularly for Metro Vancouver is really, um, you did see some cheat, some seats change and quite a sea of, of red and orange across Metro Vancouver and, and some changes there that I think it'll be quite interesting to digest going forward. So we'll have a chance to kind of get into the, the, the political makeup of, of the Metro Vancouver region, which as you say, has had seen a, a number of changes. Um, but before we led up to when uh, Prime Minister Trudeau dropped the writ back in August, uh, what were your impressions of relations and the involvement of, of the federal government at that time? I know that there were a lot of big projects, a lot of big promises, uh, but there were probably some things that didn't work quite as well as people had hoped. What were your general impressions? Lisa, I'll maybe start with you and what you thought of how things were working between uh, the local governments here and the federal government. 
Yeah, I'm happy to start there. I mean, I personally felt a, a good working relationship with our local MPs and, and the government today. Um, I've seen investments in housing and childcare, and, and that was big for the city. As you know, housing is top of mind for residents in Vancouver. Um, but also, um, as we're seeing the expansion now uh, of the Broadway line, uh, the focus on transportation and, and public transit in particular. And so from my perspective, um, a strong focus. But I do think um, there's room for improvement about how we work uh, both with the federal government and provincial government on um, issues that span the political spectrum, but in terms of issues like the complexity of not only housing, but mental health and addictions, particularly as we're seeing some of the issues that we're seeing play out in the city of Vancouver, the struggles there. And I was calling for a task force that would be uh, interprovincial federal uh, to address some of those issues. Well, as somebody who had a chance to be uh, on the Board of Governors for the City of Vancouver by being on council, you got to have a front row seat on some of those things. And and I know that uh, issues like the opioid crisis, it felt like um, there were some interesting things happening there, but not the the to the extent that perhaps uh, maybe the public and some um, people were hoping for. Rob, what were your kind of takeaways pre-2021 uh, uh, election 44, what did you think was happening in terms of that relationship between the federal and uh, local governments? Well, you know, I remember when, when in older days, in the olden days, um, when Vancouver was very peripheral to what happened on the federal scene. And I think it's kind of interesting that we're more of a focus now um, and more of a place of interest um, that we weren't, you know, even a decade ago. Um, and the fact that he was here and that he came here, that he's engaged in the transit file, in the, the uh, Massey Tunnel replacement um, file, but also housing. The fact that they're getting more interested in what's always been an issue here, uh, which is affordability, housing affordability, and getting, getting back into the housing market in a, in a real way that would impact Vancouver. Lisa, do you think, uh, you mentioned earlier on about the the, um, the political makeup. So we lost, essentially we lost four conservative seats uh, between here and Langley. Uh, so in the Tri-Cities, Richmond, some of them were very interesting in terms of, um, uh, they were really quite surprising in some way. Um, is it possible that the federal government will just take that urban support for granted? Um, what do you think, uh, you know, the city of Vancouver and people living in these uh, government held ridings um, should expect in return for their support? Um, you mentioned opioids, transportation, but, you know, what are, what are, the, what are the hopes? How can, how can the, um, the federal government be a, a strong supporter of, of change in our region? Um, I certainly don't um, think that the government's going to take it for granted, but I do think it's an opportunity, which is, is that uh, the number of seats that uh, uh, government seats that are held here in the lower mainland. And I think it does present an opportunity for us um, to um, identify the issues that are top of mind here. And, and, and Rob touched on housing and housing affordability. Um, I think childcare. So when you look at um, the cost to families uh, beyond uh, after rent or mortgage payments, uh, child care is probably the next biggest cost for a family. I mean, I was paying upwards of $20,000, $25,000 a year for two kids in child care. Um, uh, transportation, public transit. Uh, but I also think closely tied to the public transit conversation is, is seeing the federal government uh, support municipalities in climate mitigation efforts and it does go hand in hand with the public transit discussion and because we're seeing increasingly that is a cost driver for not just Vancouver and often we talk about Vancouver but I was just at UBCM last week and the key cost drivers are housing attainability climate mitigation and community safety including uh, not just public safety on the ground but cyber safety so I would like to see um, uh, some efforts to um, address that as well. Climate mitigation is a term that I'm starting to hear a little bit more. Um, can you give me an example of uh, some of the things that, that were discussed at UBCM in terms of uh, uh, that topic? Yeah, certainly. Um, one of them was sea level rise. And given that we're a uh, port city, you look at Metro Vancouver, uh, not just Vancouver, but Richmond for as well, uh, Delta. Um, but that is an area that we talked about for sure. Uh, we also know the biggest emissions are buildings and then vehicles. Again, so going back to why is it important to invest in public transit and to see uh, the federal government involved in, in that work. And, and obviously we're happy to see that um, investment with the Broadway line. 
is because it helps people get out of their cars and it gives them alternatives. And the better the public transit is, the more efficient it is, the more likely people are to use it and adopt it. So Rob, you get a chance to sit down with the prime minister for 10 minutes. You're going to give them the elevator pitch. Um, you're a, uh, a Vancouver citizen. You've been, um, you, you see that the, the government now has a strong foothold in terms of this region. What do you think uh, you and, and, and the city should be asking for from, from the, from the federal leaders? Well, I think, um, as you know, and as I discussed already, the affordability issue is really important. So how we can address that is, is a big question, but certainly the federal government plays a pivotal role in that. Um, and in terms of housing, um, that, that's a, that was the big file that, that belonged to the federal government before they got out of it in the 80s and 90s and um, kind of dropped it into the province. And the, you know, it really ended up in the city's lap and our budget is, really reflects that now and it never used to. So uh, that, that would be a key consideration that I would, I would talk to him about. Also the growth, you know, to, to, sorry, talking about the Port of Vancouver, the airport in Vancouver, how crucial they are to the rest of the country and how important they are that they continue to thrive, particularly the port. Um, and the federal government is key in that, in that role as well. And Granville Island, it's CMHC, that's right in the heart of the city. And it's a crucial, crucial asset that we have in this, uh, that, that I would certainly want to talk about um, expanding or shifting its role. So climate change has clearly been identified as a top priority of, of voters. And um, uh, we also have, um, I think in the city of Vancouver have made this a part of their brand is to be very focused on uh, environmental issues. So the question I have is, um, is uh, our senior levels of uh, government who are going to make these commitments going to have to do more to, to incentivize other, other, other cities in the region to get on board and, and be very supportive? I know, Lisa, you just came back from UBCM. Climate was uh, a, you know, a, a top concern of, uh, of the municipal leaders. But is, is there, what more can we do right now? Because Vancouver seems to have gone out ahead and now other cities, I think, perhaps um, are, are perhaps uh, having to look at how ways that they can also catch up. Yeah, no, it's a great question. I mean, a, a couple of things. Um, we actually met with a number of ministers last week as part of UVCM, and one of them was the withdrawal and cancellation of provincial uh, funding transfers that were going to municipalities, the CARIP funding to support uh, climate mitigation. Uh, we understand that they are looking at uh, potentially another model or framework uh, because uh, uh, Vancouver was one of the biggest recipients of that funding. Uh, but I think another conversation needs to take place. We know, so we, we know that in terms at the city level, the biggest emitters of GHG emissions is buildings, and then after that is vehicles. One of the things that the city um, is considering, and, and I, I did vote in opposition to this, was a local mobility pricing model. What I think we need is a regional uh, mo mobility pricing model or driving drive pricing model um, across the region. And I brought this up at Metro Vancouver yesterday as well, um, because I don't think that GHG emissions know uh, municipal boundaries between Vancouver, Burnaby, Vancouver, Richmond, and that if we're gonna go down the path of, because we're gonna have to replace the gas tax uh, and uh, direct funds towards public transit, we need to have a regional approach to that. And that's one example uh, where we can have a better coordination at the local level, the regional level. Rob, I know you're a citizen of uh, the downtown Burrard Peninsula core. Uh, you're probably, uh, I'm probably not driving a whole lot, except I, I think I know you like to get come back and forth in the Okanagan. Uh, but what do you, what are your thoughts about the mobility pricing? It's, it's certainly been deemed as a bit of a, uh, a controversial subject, that's for sure. Um, uh, what are your <sighs> thoughts about that? Yeah, it's a complicated issue, obviously, um, but anything that allows traffic to move faster and in a more efficient manner, I think, sorry, and not faster, but more efficiently um, should be welcomed. You know, right downtown, um, obviously it's, it's not a priority for us to get in our car and drive around. We tend to walk or even ride bikes. Um, but uh, having said that, again, I mentioned the port and I mentioned how important it is that link that goes, that's right downtown, that's off the peninsula here. So how we address, you know, goods movement, I think is, is also key. So if we can do it in such a way that um, addresses 
people's needs. Um, I, I think if it can be done, I think it's something that we should talk about and we should work on. So we've been through a very difficult and continue to be in a very difficult uh, public health emergency. And uh, a lot of uh, parts of the, the region have been hit very hard. Uh, we certainly know that uh, things like restaurants, small businesses, um, uh, a lot of uh, things, healthcare now have all been impacted greatly by this. Federal government now has uh, has a job of trying to help us get through the other side, um, get to uh, beyond the pandemic and, and look at pandemic recovery. You know, Lisa, if you were to um, kind of repeat the the last 18 months over uh, and, and from the standpoint of the city, I'm sure you've probably seen things that could have been done more effectively, but let's just say that if we're going to hit the reset button and we want to move forward, what are the things that we can do better and how um, can the federal government, do you think, support that? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I'm certain there are things we would do differently. Um, I do think that one of the things we learned from uh, the pandemic is, despite how challenging it was, is that we can get to yes in a much easier fashion. Um, often, I think governments, all level governments are guilty of this, is we put in place regulatory red tape and it, it's an unnecessary burden to small businesses and to residents. Um, it makes it difficult to advance things. And we get mired in the, well, that's not possible. Well, actually, the pandemic actually taught us, oh, actually, lots of things are possible if we put our minds to it and if we start to examine the frameworks we have in place. And if you look at the um, a great example of that was the patios and the introduction of patios that support our restaurants and small businesses downtown and, and around the city. Um, it, it was, they moved very quickly to get the licenses and the permits in place for that. Um, and again, if there's a will, there's a way. And so I think that's the lens that needs to be put on anything we do, um, uh, both whether it's locally, but also the federal government. And I think also supporting businesses to be more mobile. Um, uh, we've seen a lot of businesses move online, but they didn't really have the necessarily the skill set and the expertise and the infrastructure to do that. Uh, so that's another area I think potentially the federal government could play a role. Uh, I know that there's work being done on, on improving the permitting. Uh, uh, you and uh, Sarah Kirby Young, uh, other city councillor, um, uh, sort of were drivers on that topic. And, and uh, it looks like there are some, some positive changes on there that are coming in that front. But any sort of other thoughts on what you could have, you know, we could have done? Yeah, no, I mean, one of the things that I think about in the context you raised the permits and licenses is that we actually, um, Fundamentally, if we address that, you will make it easier for businesses. That is, we're in the midst of trying to deal with how to make it simpler for commercial renovations, change of use. Um, but those are areas that, um, uh, that that staff are tackling right now. But if we had done that prior to the pandemic, even um, we could have um, made it a lot easier to do business in this city. And you raise the subject of, of community safety, public safety. Um, absolutely, that's been an issue, and we're hearing that downtown, which is why you know we've been calling for more support in the neighborhoods that are affected. And and we see VPD has been responding now with more um, neighborhood patrols. Um, I think that certainly plays a role. Yeah, and I'm sure the the VPD would love to respond to it, but everything has a price tag att attached to it. And I and I know that when you're going to the budget, that's where a difficult conversation starts to happen. Um, Rob, uh, you know, um, Vancouver has is not the only place in Canada that it has struggled, but it certainly has been a difficult uh, time for a lot of our sectors of our economy. Uh, employment is a is a, a, a real challenge. Getting people to um, to fill jobs. Um, uh, has been uh, it has been a real challenge. What are the uh, you know again things that you think that the, the the federal government can do to support this region in terms of its economy going forward? Um, well, I think they're key in in terms of our our international linkages. I like to again, I'm focusing on the port and the, the airport, but that's so important when you, when you think about what happened and the fact that our supply chain during the height of this kind of COVID experience didn't fall apart. I mean, there was some empty shelves because of toilet paper shortages and that type of thing. But the fact is, we all got our food. We all got, you know, we all really didn't go uh, hungry. We, did, we didn't uh, want for anything necessarily. And I think that is quite amazing that the supply chain was able to adapt and react so quickly um, to what was going on. I'm, I'm 
uh, that's something that we really haven't, I don't think, uh, given enough credit um, to to all those players out there, the frontline retail workers and everybody else that's been involved with, in the transportation logistics. But certainly, I, I think the federal government has a role to play in that and making sure that um, the system that um, um, the infrastructure that's in place is is functioning appropriately and uh, is up to date and is current and is ready to um, adapt to these kind of crises when they come up. And I think they, in a large part, they did. So I want to maybe just talk a little bit about the, uh, the, the political landscape as far as this uh, federal election goes. Uh, we saw uh, something um, emerge very early on in the, in the federal campaign around the Green Party. And uh, the Green Party, of course, the very first ever Green elected official was Adrian Carr and Vancouver City Councilor in Canada. Uh, the uh, Green Party um, uh, was able to be a, a, a coalition partner, if you'd like, in the provincial government. Uh, they elected uh, more seats in the federal government. And then those, those fortunes seemed to have turned. We saw uh, 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 seats lost uh, in, in, um, in the provincial election last year. We've seen, we saw it reduced down to two seats this year. One happened just as a result of a, a federal liberal candidate having to, to step down. So um, I want to get your take on what you see uh, the fortunes are for the Green Party. I realize that uh, uh, that you work closely with them on council, uh, Lisa, but uh, you know they've been accused by some people of not really sort of standing um, really for, for um, what they allegedly um, are for, which is environmental causes. They seem to have um, taken some uh, positions on council, for example, that have been uh, not necessarily reflective of, of those values. Um, where do you think that the Green Party is going to be in terms of uh, um, Canadian politics and perhaps in, in terms of regional politics? Yeah, no, it's, it's a great question, Mike. I, I think I think at the federal and provincial level, um, there's quite a bit of rebuilding necessary there. And, and I think as we've seen with um, uh, other parties in the past is um, you, they need to broaden their appeal. And I, I think particularly in light of the fact when you look at whether it be federally or provincially, um, the NDP, the Liberals, um, they have, uh, and the Conservatives, but largely other parties have brought forward um, uh, public policy proposals and platforms around climate mitigation. I think there's a recognition that climate response and climate change is not a partisan issue, just as we dealt with other issues like mental health and addictions. And those parties have uh, platforms. And I think during the federal election, uh, the federal Liberals were touted as having maybe the, the strongest platform for that. So I think the challenge for the Green Party is to sort of renew itself and 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 um, and what are the issues they stand for? At the civic level, I I, I don't think it's quite as um, um, challenging or troubling for at the lo at the local level in terms of the green uh, councillors who are serving on council. Uh, I think they do have a strong base here. I, I do, and I think climate is an important issue for residents of Vancouver. So I I do think they're slightly removed from some of the federal provincial conversations. Well, I heard, uh, I've heard it said that the Green um, Party brand is potentially the one with um, the most resonance right now uh, compared to what's happening because we've seen some uh, ups and downs with uh, some of the uh, other parties. We'll maybe talk about Vision Vancouver and uh, recent news about them in a, in a moment. Um, but uh, Rob, do you think that uh, the Green Party has a a strong future or do you think they really need to maybe go back to the drawing board a little bit and you know I, I think the whole problem with any sort of advocate advocacy sort of group or activist sort of group it's always a challenge when you get in and you have to focus on governance right. and I think that's such a, a difficult shift for any sort of organization and I think we see it with the Greens as well um I I mean I'm I'm a bit harsher on the Greens I consider them a populist type of party and um uh, and I don't see them as being very pragmatic, to be honest. Um, I think they're weighed down by a lot of their historical weight and their branding is super strong, but unfortunately it kind of hinders them from doing sometimes the right thing um, or, or the best thing to provide the best outcomes. Um, so I'm, I'm more of a green skeptic than anything else. I, I think there's a generational issue that they have as well with the baby boomers who were in charge, um, reflected by Adrian Carr, um, having more of, you know, Sierra Club sort of background. 
And then the newer generation, maybe Mike, maybe Pete, um, who reflect different values and, and more social justice uh, focus. And uh, that, I think there's an inherent clash there. And so it'll be interesting how they get through that, that generational shift. Rob, uh, maybe yeah. since we're talking about the, the overall sort of political makeup of the region, um, uh, there's a lot of blue voters, there's a lot of conservative voters mm -hmm. in our city. And mm -hmm. clearly, um, they, those voters um, decided not to, um, to come out in the numbers needed to try and elect uh, people. We saw some uh, losses that happened. It seems to me that the conservative movement, whatever um, that is, and it seems to be shifting even in Canada today, uh, has really struggled with where it wants to be in, uh, in, terms, of the, in terms of urban voters. If you were going to sit down and, and, and talk to your conservative friends and have that conversation, what should they be thinking about, do you think, as, uh, as people who want to represent urban ridings? Um, mm. any, any kind of ideas on that, uh, on that front? Well, I think the, the, the problem that exists is sort of this social conservatism that doesn't um, jive well with urban values in Canada today. Um, and I think any conservative sort of movement or party has to figure out how to deal with that, um, whether they uh, exclude them from their movement or whether they bring them into the fold and address those, you know, that type of audience in a palatable way for, for voters. Uh, I think that's the challenge um, and how you can you're, I don't think any conservative movement is ever going to make inroads in Vancouver without um, addressing how, you know, the, the, the fact that they would limit or um, how would they would address sort of the socially conservative aspects of, of their movement, which is a concern, I think rightly so for a lot of people here. Uh, it's a very interesting comment because uh, we have social conservative people here, we have church groups, we have other um, you know, pockets of support for, for that uh, more social conservative politics uh, in, in, um, in urban settings. But uh, the risk of any, um, any uh, political organization is to be seen as just representing um, ex-urban or rural voters. I mean, you're really uh, not going to get very far if you uh, can't uh, accommodate the interests and concerns of, of um, uh, urban centers. Yeah, and I, th I think the thing that's really changed too is just the role of social media and storytelling is more important with politics and um, emotional storytelling is really resonates with people now as opposed to sort of more practical uh, aspects of politics. So, and the whole um, concept of outrage and instant outrage, you know, in social media, it's quick to jump on anything that um, sticks out, um, and social conservatism is certainly certainly um, affected by that. Lisa, you want to um, give us your take on what uh, you would sort of tell uh, um, a member of parliament running for the conservatives here, what you think they should be thinking about? I mean, not that they... I'm sure if anybody plans to run in, 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 in a future federal election as a conservative candidate, they must be asking themselves, hey, I can, I can, I can be a conservative, but I can also be somebody who really is vested in, in, in my uh, city community. What, uh, you know, what kind of uh, priorities do you think they should be focusing on? What would be your thoughts for them? Um, well, a couple of things, you know, I was listening to Robin and actually one of the first things that came to mind for me as well was that I, I think reconciling, the conservative party needs to reconcile the, the issues around that social conservative, social conservatism, um, particularly when you consider our urban centers are very diverse and dynamic and, and I think that is an issue that they need to address. I think that um, the conservatives lost some votes to the PPC, the rise of that party uh, in Canada. Um, I, and I think, um, you know, we talked earlier about um, parties like the Green Party having to broaden their appeal. Um, I, I think uh, similarly, I, at one stage, it was a couple of years ago where the Conservative Party was talking about they weren't um, recognizing climate change. I think it was one, one of the motions that came, the resolutions that came to the floor in their convention. Um, but I, I do think they need to reconcile some of these issues and particularly, 
the way I look at voters and residents and, and the public is that they're multidimensional. And so uh, while there are ballot box issues or issues that people vote on because there's a particular issue of, of concern to them, um, people also are looking to um, what are the values that are espoused by uh, an organization, whether it's a political party, a civic organization, and so um, I, I think I think Rob made a, a good point there about how do you how does the, the Conservative Party reconcile those issues, particularly um, with uh, urban voters? Well, it will uh, we'll see because again, I think it has been the a, a real challenge, and I know that we've got, to, for example, a BC Liberal leadership uh, uh, campaign going on right now. Uh, we're going to be looking at leaders who are also have the the same quest of trying to find uh, find a foundation, a foothold in cities that have uh, progressively gone more to the NDP um, in, in the last uh, couple of elections. But again, um, it's about how do we um, how do we bridge those uh, those uh, uh, concerns of city dwellers with those uh, of uh, of um, you know, these um, conservative and, you know, center-right political organizations. Um, anyway, I know that we won't be able to sort of resolve or solve that in, in, in this conversation, but it's definitely one that I find really interesting and uh, it has real implications for, for future elections in this region. Um, the Vancouver at times feels um, like it has been struggling. It's been struggling a little bit. There's a, there's a, uh, a, a grumbling that goes on there and uh, and and the public is, is is restless and so they're going to be asking um, for some change out of this election I think they're they rightly would expect some change so if you're going to sit down with um, a uh, a local MP and say look here are the things that we can work on together and we can we can that we think that the public are really uh, in favor of what are the maybe the top two things that you think those members of parliament should be focusing on, the ones that are representing uh, Vancouver riding specifically. Rob, maybe I'll start there with you. Well, I, first I wanna address what you were saying, because I think that the outcome of this election is that people completely did not expect any change or anything. You know, uh, the, the, the fact that we ended up with basically the same key, the seat count as, as going into the election, I think shows that People just want stability and and calm and nothing new or different than what's been happening. I think there's a real anxiety out there in regards to big movements and and big changes and you know even changing the government was I think off the table for for just about everybody. So um, um, so I just wanted to address that. <laughs> yeah, no, um, and and I and I I agree with you that there was it was a, a status quo from that from that mm -hmm. standpoint. Um, I wonder, though, that, um, it, you know, it didn't seem like that it was all uh, uh, apple pie during this election. There was a lot of Not people. Not at all. No, no. And, and a lot of, uh, uh, I think someone said but, people who are normal were angry and people who are angry, normally angry, <laughs> or were completely crazy, you know. And I think that's just a sign of our times right now. It's just people want stability and, and want um, some, a system they can rely on. The CERB, that's, I think, one of the reasons. CERB was so popular as a policy brought in by the federal government. Um, it just provided that sort of, okay, we can all just kind of try and relax even though nobody's in the mood to relax right now. But I, I would just talk about housing. Um, you Going back to your question, housing and, and affordability, I think any way they can address those two issues, and of course they're intertwined, uh, is a way um, would be my advice um, from the federal level. Yeah, Lisa, federal policies that push that. So it, it, housing, the same uh, thing that you would press with with members of parliament, Lisa? Um, a couple of things. So I'll, I'll tackle that one as well. It's uh, one thing, uh, certainly top of mind would be housing, but I would combine it with housing and homelessness. You've got two different issues mm -hmm. going on. You've got housing attainability and affordability. So people um, looking for a range of housing options um, that's gonna meet their needs and their incomes, that ties into the affordability. Um, but we also have a growing homelessness issue. It's, it's not just Vancouver, we know that. Uh, and the plight of individuals who are falling through the cracks. And so I, I, I that would be definitely part of the conversation. Um, and the other, um, there's a couple of things, but the other one I, I want to hone in on because I, I, I think that um, it's also increasingly pronounced in Vancouver is the concerns around um, the public health concerns around mental health and addictions. We declared an opiate overdose crisis in 2016 as a province. And I think if you ask those people, 
they don't feel it's getting better. They feel it's getting worse. There's a whole bunch of reasons why the pandemic definitely exacerbated things around uh, homelessness, but also around tainted drug supply, which has continued. Um, but I would want to be, and, and I, I did call for this at council. I called for a, a provincial federal uh, civic task force um, to bring together the experts um, that we need to turn this ship, just as we did with the pandemic. The pandemic was uh, identified. We've got to, everybody's got to fall in line. We've got to have a strategy and a plan and look at where we are today. It's not perfect. We still have some issues. We've got a new variant, but there was a recognition that we couldn't just sit idly by and do nothing, that we needed to mobilize all the different levels of government to address the pandemic. I would be bending the ear of our local MPs, and I intend to, don't worry, um, around this very issue, but on mental health and addictions, because it's it's playing into livability of the city, it's tying into concerns around community safety, um, and, and, and it, is, it is a public health issue. We have people who are falling through the cracks, and just sorry, linking this back, Mike, to the provincial discussions. Um, we've been calling for uh, urban mayors uh, and councillors for a model of complex care housing and the feds could play a role in this and this is a model of housing that is goes beyond our supportive housing where we actually can reach the individuals who are falling through the cracks um, these are individuals who may have brain trauma they may have had uh, suffered multiple overdoses um, uh, but they are uh, on our streets and they're not getting the type of care they need. They're not getting it in SROs. They're not getting it in supportive housing. And this is something that we talked to provincial ministers about last week. Um, how do we advance a model um, like that? And so those are a couple of things. Um, we talked earlier about transportation because I think public transit is critical um, going forward. Uh, but there's, and we also need to talk about the economy because there are play key, key players in trade and immigration. And so. Rob, you said that um, people wanted that that stability, that that status quo, I would say that Lisa is almost suggesting just the opposite, that we really do need to see change, particularly on mental health mm -hmm. and addictions. The opioid yeah. crisis is completely unacceptable. Um, and, you know, I mean, I realize that our members of parliament work hard, our, our uh, elected officials work hard, but boy, they got to roll up their sleeves on this one. Do you agree on that? I mean, I would agree, but again, it's so centralized. The issue, you know, if we look at downtown east side, that's one riding. I guess it overlaps on another riding. So we've centralized all the major issues into two ridings. Is there really an incentive for, I'm being very cynical here, but is there really an incentive for other MPs to focus on this issue when it's not in their own riding? Um, is there an issue for the province when we know that those people are coming from all over the province, all over the country, and they're all going through this experience there, which for me seems like the ultimate trauma, you know, community-based trauma. But I guess what I'm concerned about is, is there the, incent the real incentive? We haven't seen it yet. And is there the true incentive to deal with this problem on a regional basis, a provincial basis, a federal basis? I don't, I don't know if there is, I, they, they know it's there. They just want to keep it there. It speaks to how um, decisions and uh, are made in, in government and how power works in this, in this country. I think we mm -hmm. need to, uh, it, this has to be something um, that, uh, that burns inside um, uh, the prime minister and, and other uh, key members of cabinet. They have to really get activate on this one because uh, this challenge is not just, even though you do say that the, the visible um, experience of the downtown east side and, and parts of Vancouver, but we also know there are parts of Surrey, parts of yeah, right. uh, the Fraser Valley right, or, yeah. or other, and, and uh, the overwhelming majority of people are dying are dying in their homes by themselves. Uh, and, they're, and that's happening in all communities. It's happening on the west side, it's happening on the east side. Anyway, um, so just uh, maybe on, on a little bit of a lighter note, uh, for, uh, let's kind of just round out, be talking about uh, just Vancouver politics. Um, I, I wanted to just uh, talk about a story that came out uh, this week that uh, Vision Vancouver, who, let's face it, Vision Vancouver, um, uh, not many of us on this call were, were terribly supportive of that organization when they governed, uh, have been having a, a few bumps. They uh, clearly uh, were kind of wiped out and, and uh, left uh, outside, of, uh, uh, outside of government 
during the 2018 election. They're trying to go through some kind of a revival themselves right now, uh, but they uh, hit a bit of a bump in the road in that the Vancouver District Labor Council, who traditionally have been a, an important vehicle for uh, uh, center and, uh, and, and left wing um, uh, councillors and, and park board and, and school board, um, have said, um, we're not going to be supporting vision. So um, uh, I don't think we're going to cry a lot of tears about that necessarily, uh, but it, it, uh, it does tell you that, that they're making some choices and changes are going to be coming in, in terms of um, Vancouver politics in the future. What's your sort of, um, what's your, give us your inside baseball and what you think this, um, this announcement by the VDLC and, and, the, and the troubles that Vision faced means? Maybe I'll start with you, Rob. I always think it's interesting how VDLC and their endorsement process is so kind of overlooked by a lot of um, people and seem to be quite acceptable. Um, we know that during Vision's time, you know, Jeff Meg was in there um, making deals. I think there were tapes of the conversation and how, how it worked, I think. Um, but uh, I, I think their role chiefly is ensuring that the left vote is not as split as it could be. And they do a good job at that, limiting the candidates that come forward. But I think we sometimes overstate their um, power in terms of their endorsement, the actual endorsement when it comes to the ballot box. And we can see that in the past when they do endorse candidates, it really doesn't reflect in the outcomes of the ballot box. Uh, with 71 council candidates running, um, you know, the people that they necessarily endorse, it, it's not really impacted. Um, but of course, candidates are always jockeying for the endorsement and they all want to, you know, it's super important for any candidate to have that sort of wind at the back, at, at your back, as opposed to, um, uh, and it's that natural competitive nature of, of politics and politicians. But I, I do think we overstate their the BDLC's power at the ballot, at the ballot box. Lisa, I, I, I'm not sure if you're um, sitting by your phone waiting for the, uh, the VDLC uh, uh, endorsement yourself. Um, but uh, it was interesting that um, that there were changes to the uh, election legislation um, uh, in, in, in BC that were announced, uh, I think it was uh, um, late last year, that will have implications for the 2022 election, um, including uh, providing any support, uh, either in kind or directly. Uh, so it sounds like um, uh, the, from recent reports, the DLC are thinking that the rules haven't changed. What's your impression and what's your understanding of, of how we can have these third party groups involved in, in um, uh, essentially working on, on the ground in elections? Yeah, no, it's a great question, Mike, because I, when I was reading the article the, this week about BDLC uh, and their role, it, it seemed very clear that they do have intentions to be involved uh, as a third party in the upcoming civic election. And I think the whole point of the reforms that were made just before I ran in the, the, for the council election was to deal with the role of, of large unions and corporations in influencing our elections. And um, so what I'd be concerned about is how are we ensuring that those third parties are accounted for in terms of the hours that are put in, the money that's going into it. Um, there has to be a level playing field in all of this. Uh, and we have to be all be playing by the same rules. And so when I read that, you know, I immediately jumped out at me as well, um, our, our, you know, how are they going to be involved and is that going to be accounted for under the new rules and so uh, I think that's something we need to be paying attention to um, all of us both the you know as candidates and, and the civic party civic organizations. Well we'll see we're uh, just about 12 months away from a municipal election and things are going to be uh, I'm already uh, interesting but I'm I expect they'll start to heat up now because this federal election which many people thought was coming for a long time, uh, was going to take up a lot of the attention span. And, and now that it's done, uh, it will uh, probably change the focus of where we're going in the city and, and across the region. I want to thank you both very much for coming on uh, the podcast. Uh, I'm still uh, trying to get my head around doing this uh, on a, uh, both an audio and video stream. But uh, it really is great to hear your uh, perspectives. And uh, I realize that this is a, uh, 
uh, uh, still pretty fresh in terms of our minds, in terms of election, but there's a lot of work uh, to come in, in terms of how uh, the, the new government, we'll have to wait to see what the, the cabinet announcements are and what the what the mandate le letters look like in terms of, uh, and, and how those uh, may affect uh, uh, Metro Vancouver as well. Um, so my guests have been uh, Lisa Dominato, a city councillor in Vancouver, and Rob McDowell. And I uh, just want to remind you all to uh, visit my new uh, Patreon page at patreon.com slash overcast YVR. And if you go to triple W overcast YVR, you'll be able to find all of the uh, previous episodes of the uh, Vancouver uh, Overcast with my class and podcast. All the best to thank you for listening. And uh, thanks to my guests. Have a, a great day. Thanks for having us. Thanks.